Man, I'm going to make this autofocus work eventually. I just know I am. I graduated from a $20 camera to an $80 camera. It boasts autofocus, and I still can't make the autofocus work. <sighs> Technology. You gotta love it. Otherwise, you're gonna hate it. But for the moment, I'm gonna love it because it's that technology that allows me, Malcolm Tent, to go on to live Facebook every single week and do Tent Talks Tunes, in which I talk about some of the best things in life, which are records. Records! Love it, love it, love it! I love them, love them, love them, love them, love them. So, yeah, every week I come onto the Facebook Live to hang out with everybody out there, my fellow record geeks, freaks, and nerds, and weirdos. And then when the episode is done, I upload it onto my YouTube channel. So look up Malcolm Tent on YouTube if you want to see a lot of back episodes of Tent Talks Tunes. You can also just scroll back on my Facebook page. It's all there. It's all part of the permanent record. They threatened us all back in grade school with bad reports on our permanent record. And it took us a long time to realize that that was just a, a bunch of jive, basically. But now we have a permanent record. So I put nothing but good stuff on it. Nothing but. So yeah, man. Unlike in some places, democracy works here at Tent Talks Tunes. When the people speak, I listen. When the votes are cast, the results are reported. And since the uh, the votes were cast on my permanent record on my Facebook page and my Instagram page, it's total transparency. I have nothing to hide. You can look at my permanent record on Facebook and or Instagram, and you can see exactly how the votes stacked up. And in case you're wondering what the hell I'm babbling about, I posted earlier today about how I wanted to talk about 45s, but I was going to rely on you the frantic fan, loyal listener, and vibratory viewer to pick a number between 1 and 15, and whichever number got the most votes was going to determine what I was going to talk about tonight. And wouldn't you know it, I guess we're on the decimal system for a reason, because hands down, hands down, the most voted for number was 10. More votes for 10 than any other number. We don't even need a recount. It was like five votes for 10 and uh, one or two votes for various other numbers and one or two dissenters who uh, refuse to obey. That's democracy. So why 10 and why was I asking for that? I'll tell you why. It's because in my collection, and people have asked me for years and years and years, they say, 10, you old creep. How many records can you possibly have? How many records can a guy like you possibly have in his home? Well, I can tell you now for a fact that when it comes to 45 and 7 inch records, I have exactly 15 boxes full of 7 inch records and 45s. 11 of them are this size right here. And if you ever shopped at my old store, Trash American Style, you saw plenty of boxes of 45s this size. Okay, so I have 11 of these. 11 full-size boxes and four of those groovy carry size boxes with the psychedelic designs and the zebra stripes and polka dots and whatever. I got four of those for a total of 15. So since y'all voted for 10 as being the magic number, I simply started from the left and kind of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and came up with this one right here, box number 10, full of 45s. And so, I'm just going to randomly go through this box. I'm going to start at the very beginning. And we're going to talk about some of the records that are in my personal collection. And how cool they are. Because, let's face it, they wouldn't be in my collection if they weren't cool, baby. If they weren't really cool. <sighs> Hello, Robopuff. Hello, Greg. Hello, Zach. And um, Eric. Eric McGloin. I normally, I have a policy of only advertising myself. You know, my records, my Discogs and eBay store, my record label. But this is a very worthy cause to hell and back Pitbull, Pitbull Rescue. I back it. I endorse it. I'm all for it. 
I'm just putting it out there. I'm wearing their T-shirt, and I don't wear T-shirts just at random. I only wear, I only stand behind the stuff I stand behind. So, Mazel Tov to the Pitbull Rescue. All right. So yeah, got uh, box number ten of the Malcolm Tent 45 collection. And you know, this is something that is actually kind of funny. I have the records divided. I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna show you exactly what we're dealing with here. I have the records in my collection, very neatly organized, everything's bagged, everything's alphabetical. And I have these dividers that I made, as you can see, years and years and years ago. These dividers have been with me. They're, they're, they're plenty shop worn and, you know, stained and everything. Uh, but they do they do the job, you know. I, I can still read the letter on it. it says P. I can read the letter. It says R. So why change it, you know? But I when I made these dividers, many 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 years ago, I used whatever paper was laying around. So let's and I remember I did some interesting stuff. Let's see what before we get into the records. Let's see what these dividers are made of. Okay, here's the P divider, right? What did I do? I took a sheet of paper, folded it up into four. Oh, okay, I see what this one is. This P divider is made off of a uh, an old piece of graph paper. Anybody out there remember graph paper? Anybody as old as I am remember this stuff? This might even actually be a leftover piece of graph paper from my high school geometry class. And graph paper in the pre-computerized age was very useful for doing layouts and graphic work. Hence the name graph paper. So, okay, I had an old piece of graph paper and I folded it up, wrote the letter P on it somewhere around 35 years ago, and stuck it in the box of records. R. Here's the other divider. The other divider is R. There's the, the marker made R. And then you can, oh, I see something very interesting. Wow, okay, so this is an old flyer I had laying around. Oh, look at that. 35 years ago, I had this old flyer laying around, cluttering up my office, so I figured I would put it to use and fold it into four pieces and draw the letter R on it and stick it in my 7-inch box. Look at that. A flyer for Husker Du, live at the Fireman's Hall in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I was the ticket taker that night, May 31st, 1985. If anybody out there went to this show at the Fireman's Hall, I took your ticket. And um, I was there when they actually had to stop the show because it was so hot in the venue that the band couldn't play and the audience couldn't breathe. So they stopped the show, let everybody out, let the place air out for a few minutes, let everybody catch their breath and catch their composure, and then they let everybody back in and the band finished the set. First time I ever saw Who's Do. I didn't even know who they were. And what do you know? Look at that. I got a flyer from that very show functioning as an R divider in my record collection. Not bad. Well, it's going to go back and continue marking the R's as it has since 1985. So let's begin at the beginning, shall we? First take a sip of Walter. Let's also just uh, reach over very quickly and take a little scroll down and see who's tuned in. Yeah, Doug. Hey, Doug. Hey, Joe Malinowski. And there's Eric and Byron. Oh, Janice. Wavis Davis, Nick, glad to see you guys tuned in. So, one of the first records in the box, ooh, this is a good one. This is a real good one. This is a very, very important record for yours, truly. I think you guys have heard me talk about this guy before on Tent Talks Tunes, but this is, if my memory serves me, the second independent slash local 45 I ever bought. In South Florida, sometime around 1982, Charlie Pickett, and the eggs. If this is love, can I get my money back? First of all, that's one of the best song titles in the history of mankind. If this is love, can I get my money back? The reason I bought it, though, was for the B-side. Slow death. Now, the reason I bought it for the B-side was because one night I was tuned into the legendary, justifiably so, radio show called Radio Free Living Room which aired on WLRN, which is the educational station in Miami, every Monday night at, I think, midnight. And I would stay up <clears throat> as late as I possibly could for as long as I could and catch Radio Free Living Room every Monday. And one night, one night, 
DJ Eric Moss played the B-side, Slow Death, by Charlie Pickett and the Eggs. And I was blown away. This record rocks so hard. And this is a heretical statement time, and you all know that I specialize in heretical statements. This version of Slow Death, which is a song originally covered, which was originally by the Flaming Groovies, all right? Charlie Pickett and the Eggs version of Slow Death blows away the original by about two country miles. Plain old fat. And I told that once to Charlie Pickett himself, and he, of course, demurred, because he's that kind of a guy. He refused to believe that anything he did would ever blow away the Flaming Groovies. I'm here to tell you, kids, Charlie Pickett and the Eggs version of Slow Death is better than the original. Wow. So not only was this the second ever independent slash local record I ever bought, the first one being uh, God Punishes the Eat. And if you don't know about the Eat from Miami, Florida, get on it. Get the research team, get the internet research team together and do some homework and look up the Eat. Because the Eat are crucial. That was the first independent slash local record I ever bought. This was the second. This one I bought at, once again, to use the term immortal, and justifiably so, I bought this at Open Books and Records. And God damn it, I really wish the fucking... Listen to my profanity, kids. I'm so pissed off about this. It focuses on me, but it won't autofocus on the close-up. Maybe if I do that. Let's try that. Will it focus? You guys are so lucky you get to see me struggle through this. Well, you can still read it anyway. It is legible. I bought this at Open Books and Records. And you guys have talked, you've heard me talk about Open Books and Records forever and ever and ever. It's the record store I grew up in. Got my first job ever working at a record store was at Open. And um, I basically just hung out there so much they finally gave me a gig. But Open released this record on their label. And this was like a really prime example of how much a record store could do. Open Books and Records, and it was not only a record store, it was a label that released records by their favorite local acts. If you look on the cover and or the record, you'll see probably an ad for Song and Dance, which was their Dial a Song local events line. Way before the internet, you could call the telephone number for Open Books and Records and you'd get a pre-recorded message telling you about what gigs were coming up in the area, and they would end with a song from a brand new hot release. So Open Books and Records, I, I will never stop seeing their praises. I will never stop saluting my mentor, Leslie Wimmer, for teaching me how to run the business and showing me all the possibilities of what a record store could be. This record is great. I love this record. And it is still packaged in the homemade cellophane bag that I made for it back in 1982. You can see it's a taped together piece of old shrink wrap from an LP. And it's still holding together and it still protects my very precious and wonderful copy of If This, if this Is Love Gonna Get My Money Back by Charlie Pickett and the Eggs. All right, let's see what else we got here in my random box of 45s. Ooh, this is a really cool one. I'm gonna talk about great record stores. One of my favorite record stores is in Cleveland, Ohio, and it's called My Mind's Eye Records. And I want to say hello to Pear and Bill and Chad. Chad says, I'm going to do podcasts like this. What do you think? I think you should. If I can do it, you can do it. If I can get this cheap-ass camera with the non-functioning autofocus, you can do it and be a media star. Just do it. Whenever I'm on my record store tours or my tours playing my music, whether it's as a solo acoustic guy or with Anti-Scene or with They Hate Us or with Ultra Bunny or with my noise project Fried Man, I always hit the record stores in every town I go to. And whenever I go to My Minds, or I, my minds Eye Records in Cleveland, I don't think I've ever once, I've ever once walked out of that place empty-handed. And I just love Charles, the guy who runs the place, his... Sleeves are very descriptive. So I saw this record by The Pips. Oh, there's the autofocus. Raw R&B rocker, plays well. And what's this? Early Gladys Knight. 
Whoa, okay, and if you can hopefully see, it's credited only to the Pips. No mention of Gladys Knight. It's kind of like the, the Motown syndrome. It started out as a band called the Pips, and they separated the lead singer from the backing band. But yeah, look at this. Original Pips 45 on the original VJ label with the oval logo. No rainbow rim. It's a solid red. But this record's been beaten to death. You can tell it was a popular party record. It's been played to the max. But it still plays. This is not like a digital file that's going to disintegrate and disappear. This record's probably 60 years old, and it still plays. It sounds great. And Charles' description was right on the money. A, a raw rhythm and blues rocker. And Gladys Knight and the Pips were definitely a part of my early upbringing. And I still like a lot of their stuff. But this early, raw as hell 45 on the VJ label, that gets a double thumbs up from me. Love this record. What else do we have in the Malcolm Tent personal collection? Ooh, this is a good one. In my personal collection, look at this. This is really cool. This shows you what kind of a fanboy I am. This is a fully autographed 45 by the Pissed Jeans, entitled Your Life is Worth. I saw the Pissed Jeans, if I recall correctly, I've only seen them once. Back in the day when University of Connecticut, UConn, actually had something resembling, um, let's say, arts. When hmm, I'm going to phrase this indelicately because I was on the receiving end of some of UConn's policy changes a few years back. Back when the U University of Connecticut actually had a policy that was friendly towards the underground and friendly towards the arts and friendly towards bands, which they changed. When they did, they had a lot of cool bands play there, and once the Piss Jeans played, so I went down to the show and set up, set up my mobile record shop, my Mini Mart, and I uh, was selling records, and the Piss Jeans came over to the table and were looking through my stuff, and they wanted to buy some stuff. And I said, dude, don't buy anything, let's just trade records. I like you guys. Let's trade Piss Jeans records for Trash American style product. So we got some records together, and they swapped theirs. In fact, I got a couple right here. It's another really good Piss Jeans record. One of the great names of all time, the Throbbing Organ. So I traded Piss Jeans records for my merch. For some reason, I only had them sign one. I don't know why. Maybe I was feeling lazy that night or didn't want to get on their nerves. But they totally, totally rocked the house. And I was also doubly, doubly pleased to find that they already knew of my band, Ultra Bunny, and were fans of Ultra Bunny. So that was cool. That's why I love going out into the field and seeing bands and meeting them and talking to them and cross-pollinating our collections and, you know, just ugh, getting into it and being a fanboy. I also taped the show. It came out great. So here's a big salute from my famous vessel full of uh, Danbury tap water to the Piss Jeans and other great noisy bands in this world of ours. Man, this is fun. I'm, I, do, I usually don't delve into my personal record collection that often. Like when I was doing radio regularly, which we of course know I'm not, my regular radio show on WNHU in West Haven, I was in and out of the library constantly, but I haven't done that since they instituted the new normal. So I haven't looked at my personal record collection in quite a while, so this is really cool. We're having a lot of uh, shared mutual discovery here. Now this is something I like. This is one that I've never heard of this band, and I'd be surprised if you guys have ever heard of this band, but this is one of the great joys of record collecting. It's completely obscure and unknown bands from all time periods and all genres. And this is a record that I no doubt found in a dollar bin somewhere. I really know nothing about them. This is a group called Placebo. And it's on the Aura Records label out of England. God. It's got to come into focus at some point, right? Doesn't it? Come on, $80 camera. Don't let me down. I got people watching this. All right, screw it. A cheap camera is a cheap camera, no matter how much you pay for it, I guess. Anyway, it's placebo. It's English. 
it's a new wave record. My lo my notes on it say that the uh, the A side paying homage, good new wave female vox that's vocals, vaguely Gary Newman ish, and the B side entitled Gita is downbeat and not bad. So look at that. For one dollar, I found a really cool obscure UK new wave 45 from the magic year of 1982. And I know nothing about these guys. I couldn't tell you anything about them. I'm sure there's probably a million things by them on YouTube or whatever, but I, I'm kind of enjoying the mystery of not knowing who this really, really cool English new wave band is that I found for a dollar somewhere. This is a band that a lot of people know. Oh boy, yeah. There are a very few bands that I actively collect and that I try to get everything of. Not a whole ton of them, luckily. Because I live in a very small house. It's not necessarily a tiny house, but it's a small little house. It's big enough for me, and it's big enough for Harry the Cat, who, as usual, is asleep on the sofa right now. So the few bands that I actively collect, I actively collect. And oddly enough, I only have four original singles by the Plasmatics. Only four. But there, I, you know, there might not even be that many other than this. I think, I think this is all of the recorded output by the Plasmatics on 45. And the Plasmatics were one of those bands that just completely blew me away in 1981 when they were on Fridays and The Tomorrow Show and SCTV. You couldn't get away from the Plasmatics during the year 1981. And I loved them. Oh, man. They were like just so loud and so raw and so overdriven and so theatrical and they looked so good. Love the Plasmatics. And the fact that they actually marketed their records as being on exciting colored vinyl. This was marketed in so many words as being on puke vinyl. How is some kid at the age of 17 or 16 going to resist a record that is pressed on puke vinyl? I didn't do it. I went and I bought it. $3.49 at the time, which was kind of expensive for a 45. But for puke vinyl, it was worth it. For still one of the best posed live photos ever on a record. That is that is right up there with Kiss Alive, Judas Priest Unleashed in the East. That is awe-inspiring faux live posing. Great. And of course, since I was of that age, I was of that age, I don't know if you guys can see this, but if you look very carefully, that, that uh, picture of Wendy O. Williams silhouetted against the explosion, that's a nipple right there. You can see that that is a female nipple silhouetted against a big ball of fire. To a 17-year-old South Florida boy, that was damned exciting. And it's mildly exciting now, too. Sorry, I, I'm was getting lost in the moment. I'm, I'm I'm back. I'm back. Plasmatics, love the plasmatics. This one is also on another variant of puke vinyl. Oh, that one's real puke vinyl. Look at that. That's positively vomitos. Didn't really see vinyl pressed on uh, splatter colors like that back then. A real commodity, and just a masterpiece of of graphic art and design. That just is so strong and so bold and so no-nonsense, you cannot resist it. That's the way a record is supposed to look. Genius, kids. Genius. And like um, most of the records I've shown you so far, these are all records I bought when I was a kid back in the 80s. Still with me. The good stuff stays. The good stuff stays. Let's see, what else do we have in the Malcolm Tent personal collection that really leaps out? And uh, oh, this is a cool one, too. We talked about the Pips earlier, the early version of Gladys Knight and the Pips. This is a record I never, ever thought was actually going to rock, but it totally rocks. Normally, when I'm digging through boxes of 45s or stacks of LPs, 
you know, after a while you get to learn that certain labels are mostly cornball and not very interesting. And typically whenever I would see something on the vintage Mercury light label, I would ignore it because Mercury put out a lot of real garbage like Patty Page and, you know, real corny white boy stuff. And I also normally would not look twice at record by the platters because everybody knows the platters, you know, smooth doo-wops, smooth vocal harmonies. I don't do smooth, baby. I'm not about the smooth. No, 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 no. I'm rough, tough, and coarse. I'm practically crude. So I don't care about the platters doing only you and you alone. Uh -uh. But I got to admit, and I flipped it over and saw the B-side. The B-side entitled, entitled Bark, Battle, and Ball. I'm, one of these days I'm going to get the proportions right on this camera, too. Hey, look at that. Bark, Battle, and Ball. Now, anytime I see a song title like that, whether it's blurry or not, whether you can see it or not, a title like that catches my eye. And wouldn't you know it? It rocks tune really rocks and rolls. The platters? Who would have known the platters had that much rock and roll in them? I never would have known. One of the best dollars I spent that day in the original, very classy Mercury Records company sleeve from 1950-whatever. So if you want to find yourselves a rock and roll treat, look up Bark, Battle, and Ball by the platters. You never would have known. Never would have known. Man. I'm falling in love with my record collection all over. What else do we have here? Mm, that one doesn't... I don't know what that... Oh my gosh. This is this is a recent acquisition. Just got this one recently. Yes, this is a... <laughs> now, you want to talk about bands I mark out over and collect actively? I don't know if I have enough room in two hands to hold all of the records that I have by this group. I don't. So I'm just going to show you a smattering. Who does Malcolm Tent really mark out over that maybe you didn't know he marked out over? I'll tell you who. The Police. This is but the smallest sampling. The little, tiniest smattering of police records I have in my collection. I got so many police records that I cannot show them to you in one handful. I got a lot of damn police records. I love the police. Love them. Have ever since the first moment I heard Can't Stand Losing You on the radio in 1979, I guess, maybe late 78. Can't Stand Losing You was the first police song I ever heard, and I thought it was the funniest thing in the world. Hilarious. And the music, of course, was fantastic as well. So my ongoing love affair with the police began right then and there. First time I ever heard them. So I've been on this mad quest to get all the police stuff I possibly can. And for a very, 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 very long time, I had this copy of the debut Police 7-inch, Fallout, Nothing Achieving which was released on their own independent label in the UK, Illegal Records. Very cool because not only is it 1977 UK punk on an independent label, that has got the original police lineup on it of Sting, Stewart, and Henri. Obviously everybody knows Sting, Stewart, and Andy, but that guy up there in the white shirt and the air mouth breathing pose is Henri, the original police guitar player who was thrown out because he wasn't proficient enough. So this is a really key record for a, for a police collection. You know, if you're going to have the debut 45 by the police on the original label. However, this copy, which I've owned forever and ever and ever, is not a bona fide first, first pressing. As far as I can tell, this is actually a third pressing. And look at it carefully. You know, if you're the type of dude that I am or dudette that I am, just look at the, the label and look at the, the, the actual vinyl and look at the way it's laid out and the physical attributes of this thing. That's the third pressing. 
for many, 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 many years, I've been seeking out a bona fide first pressing, and wouldn't you know it, only a matter of maybe six or seven weeks ago, I finally found a true first pressing. When I say first, I mean first pressing of the police debut single, Fallout Nothing Achieving. The sleeves are pretty much identical, but if you look at the label and the record itself, you'll see the differences. The illegal logo is different. It's got the punch-out middle, and the typeface is different. So that is a first pressing of the police debut single, which could very conceivably have been sold by them at a gig somewhere in 1977 or at bare minimum was sold at a genuine punk rock record shop in England in 1977. That, even though they were self-admittedly punk rock opportunists and by their own admission did not know anything about punk rock legitimately, they were bandwagon jumpers, they said it, but this was the right record in the right place at the right time. And it's the first. Finally got one. My main man, Larry Mann, wants to know if I would be willing to part with any 45 RPM police records. Larry, if I got duplicates of any police records, I'm willing to part with them. Hit me up. My first, middle, and last name is Cell. Which is why you can just call me Cell, Cell, Cell. That's why I have thoughtfully provided my Discogs and eBay sign here. So you can look me up. TPOS. Name of my label. It's the name of my store. Look up TPOS. And that's just a mere thimble out of the ocean full of the records that I have to sell. That's how I put my bread on the table, kids. By selling records. And these days especially, I will take all the help I can get in hooking up you with the records you need so I can get the money I need to pay my bills. Simple capitalism. And I do it right. Everybody walks away from the table happy, as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, Larry, hit me up. Send me a message. Anybody wants some records, send, you know, hit me up. Send me a message. I've got thousands of records for sale. And they're all good. They're all good. I don't do crap. All good records. Whew. See, the police led to good things. Yeah, okay, I'm leafing through the police records. In fact, I'm going to let everybody out there know there's only one police record that I really... I, I need one police 45. It's key to my collection. There's a bunch that I could use, but the one that I need, there's a Japanese version of... Um, Oh, God, what is it now? I've totally forgotten which one it is. I need it so badly I can't remember. But there's a Japanese karaoke 45 that came out in 1983. Um, one of the songs off Synchronicity. And it's instrumental versions, like genuine, played by the police, instrumental versions of two of their songs designed for karaoke use. I need that record. That's the police record I really need. If anybody out there's got one, let me know. I'm sure we can make a deal. Need that record. Let's see. Well, we've got some Iggy Pop records here, but I don't feel like talking about them necessarily right now. This is a really weird one. I don't know much about this. I don't remember where I... Oh, I do remember. I found this one. Okay, one of, one of the great Connecticut record stores was Brass City Records in Waterbury, Connecticut, which, appropriately enough, is... The Brass City. And Walter, who owned Brass City, was a, a great guy. One of my very favorite people in the record business. And I can count the number of people that I don't get along with in the record business on one, maybe two fingers. There's only a couple. Almost everybody in the record business I know, I love, and I'm friends with. Walter was a great guy. And he was another 
record store owner who was kind of a mentor to me when my, when I was very first starting out. And uh, unfortunately, Walter left the planet a few years ago. And after that happened, I was called upon to help liquidate the record store and its contents. And so in doing that, I ended up buying a lot of records. And one of them I picked up just because it looked interesting. And this is where I discover so much great music, just because it looks interesting. I don't know what it is. Never heard of it before. It's not like a pedigreed record that everybody wants. It just looks interesting. And for some reason, Walter had not only the record by this group called, I'm going to guess it's pronounced Port Said. He had the record, and bundled with the record was an acetate of the Port Said. And uh, just a very, I've talked about acetates before. One of my very first episodes of Tent Talks Tunes was about acetates and test pressings. You can look that one up on my YouTube channel or my Facebook. But a one of a kind handmade acetate record. Uh, I hope you can see that. Oh, look at that. Now it's focusing. That's cool. I guess I have to hit it at an angle and it will focus. I'm learning, kids. I'm learning. 1981. It's a vaguely new wave-ish record with vaguely eastern sounds, as you might guess. And this is an acetate made at the studio for reference purposes. And it was bundled in with a regular copy of the Port... Oh yeah, there you go. I have to hit it at an angle. A regular copy of the Port Said record, which has actually a different B-side. So it's pretty fascinating. Uh, same deal. Don't know anything about them, except they're apparently from New York City. Apparently. Came out in 1981. It's a good record. And we have the officially released version of the record and an unreleased version of it on acetate. That's cool. I love this kind of stuff. Maybe the internet research team can get on it and see who Port Said is and who these people, Musella, Tischler, and Walsh, are boy my hand look at that look at that hand isn't that like the most hideous thing you've ever seen in your life showing through the record looks like a big piece of protoplasm or something looks like it's going to jump out and suck your eyeballs out Ooh, gross gross sorry to distract you guys but yeah musella tischler and walsh port saeed know nothing about them one of those cool, rare, I don't even know if it's rare, but just totally obscure records that turn out to be really good. And we got a few more minutes left here. I said that since we were talking about 45s today, I was only going to go on for 45 minutes. We're on for 39 so far, so we're, we're getting to the home stretch here. Oh my god, got to talk about this. This, this, if anybody has known me, knows that this is one of my favorite, favorite records. I could probably talk about this, but I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to show it to you. I'm going to let the record do the talking. This is immortal. This is the greatest Elvis Presley record ever made. Number one Elvis record ever. Elvis Presley, Do the Clam, from the Girl Happy album. Do yourselves a favor and do the clam. Written by Ed Wood's girlfriend. That's a fact. Ed Wood's girlfriend. What else do we have in Malcolm Tent box? Ooh, so many great. Ooh, here's a good. Oh, I like this one. This is this is really cool. This is really cool. This is really obscure. I also got this one from Brass City Records, but a long time ago. This is another one where the cover kind of says it all. You folks might know that I'm a giant size mark for Public Image Limited. Also known as, if you can see up close right there, PIL. 
as blurry as it may be. Now, how come it focused a second ago, but now it's not focusing when I held it at an angle? Whatever. This is the bootleg 7-ish that came out of, as it says right there, the famous Riot Show. I love it when you're able to cram an entire gig onto a 7-inch. And this is typical bootleg stuff, you know, it's cheaply pressed on crappy vinyl. The sound quality of the recording itself is lousy. Plain white labels. You all can't, I mean, you're not here with me, but you, you can't see how just cheap this vinyl is. It's total, like, Taiwanese regrind. It's terrible. But it's the entire concert that Public Image Limited played in New York City in 1981 that ended in a riot with people trying to destroy the venue. And um, it's hilarious. It's really funny. I have no doubt whatsoever that you can look this up and hear it in its entirety. Public Image Limited at the Ritz, May 15, 1981, Riot Show. The, the recording itself is murky as hell, but you can hear it. Gets my vote for sheer absurdity and wonderfulness. Thank you, bootleggers, for preserving it on vinyl. All right, what else does Malcolm Tent have in his collection that he really feels like showing the people? Oh, well, that's all the P's. Now we got the Q's. Hmm. Oh, ah, ooh, do I want to show you that? Nah, it's not really that interesting. That one's not that interesting. You see, you kind of have to go through a whole bunch of records in order to... Ah, this is one. I posted this one before once. This is not really the rarest record in the world. I mean, it's pretty damn rare. And it's extremely cool. The album that this record was taken from actually really, really, really caused the waves. The album was the one that changed the universe as we know it. But the fact that there was, believe it or not, a... <laughs> A promotional 45 RPM single for Blitzkrieg Bach by the Ramones that was actually shopped to radio stations in the hopes that it would get some airplay kind of blows my mind. I don't know if this came out before the album or after, probably before, but this very conceivably could be the first, and I use this term very loosely, punk rock record ever. Now, before the tidal waves begin, remember, I just I use the term extremely loosely, extremely loosely, that this could be the first punk rock record ever. Blitzkrieg Bach by the Ramones. And Stereo on the other with Havana Affair. How cool is that? I think that's pretty cool. I don't think it's too cool that I dropped the sleeve, but that's why we have backup. All right, let's start wrapping this thing up, man. I actually have a, a video conference call that I have to take in a few minutes, so it really does behoove me to sign off pretty soon. Um, I will say I'm working on a very exciting project right now. Ooh. This is a cool one. Jimmy Reed. Usually, experience, usually experiments like this do not work at all. But in this case, it did work. You know, you take an old blues guy and you stick him with some modern, newfangled musicians and try to bring them up to date. That's how we got god-awful, horrible records like uh, Electric Mud by Muddy Waters and uh, the Howlin' Wolf album, where the front cover says, this is Howlin' Wolf's new record, he hates it. Well, he should have hated it because it's god-awful. It's horrific. You take a guy like Howlin' Wolf and you let him be Howlin' Wolf. You don't put him with a bunch of newbie psychedelicos and try to make him into a hippie. It doesn't work. But somehow, when some genius put Jimmy Reed in the studio toward the end of his life, put Jimmy Reed in the studio and recorded this record Crying Blind, it actually came out really well. It's not uh, it's not like that Muddy Waters record or that Howlin' Wolf record. They didn't try to make the guy psychedelic. They just tried to make him funky. They gave him kind of a funky band, and it actually works. There it goes. 
Sounds really good. Torrid production? Yeah, it's kind of torrid. But it's funky and it's decent and Jimmy Reed sounds good and it's a fine record. Probably very low on most Jimmy Reed collectors want lists, but I love it. It, it genuinely, it does the job. It's not an embarrassment like it could have been. Really cool late period record by Jimmy Reed. Out of Chicago, and by the looks of it, this was pressed by VJ, I'm going to guess, because he was a VJ recording artist when he first started out. Really great stuff. All right, I got time for one more. I'm going to show you guys one more record. What should it be? Hmm, should it be the, I don't know, what should it be? The, the first pressing of the first REM single on their original independent label, Hibtone? Yeah, you've probably seen one of those already. Um, got a lot of REM. Oh boy, how about um, how about some residence records? We got residence records. Love the residence. Don't know if that's the one. Maybe I'll show you that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up with a record that, once again, I mean I could go on all day. This represents the thrill of discovery. It's another record that I heard absolutely at random once on the radio. And this was on um, the other great South Florida radio show, which was called um, Off the Beaten Path. The DJ there was Bob Slade. Bob Slade, who appears to have disappeared. Nobody seems to know where Bob Slade is. If you're out there, Bob Slade, call home, please. I want to thank you for turning me on to this record right here. I heard just at random, just completely at random, I heard this song on his show, great second wave UK punk, like early 80s UK punk. And the chorus was, join the army, join the army, it's no life at all. Join the army, join the army, they'll put you up against the wall. Awesome record, but I didn't catch who it was by. Did not catch who it was by. So for many years, it was just an earworm. It stuck in my mind. I'm pretty sure I had a recording of it on cassette too, but without the information as to who it was. And it just stuck with me, stuck with me, stuck with me. And I always wanted to know who the hell it was that did this great song called Join the Army. And one day, and this goes to show you how we used to do it old school. One day I was reading an issue of Goldmine magazine Yes, Goldmine, which is still publishing to this very day. Goldmine is still a bona fide print magazine serving the needs of record collectors. I still read it. Back in the day, back in the day, Goldmine used to be this huge, like, you know, 11 by 17 thick tome, and most of it was ads for records and auctions and stuff like that. And the auction lists would be, would be printed in this, in this ridiculous, like, four-point type quite often. So you'd have to get a magnifying glass or whatever and just scroll through like line after line after line after line after line after line of typewritten and then shrunk listings for records for auction and I was going through one of those auction lists and I saw a it, it was so weird I just saw the listing for this record called Resistance 77 and um, the song the uh, four song EP entitled Nowhere to Play I don't know why, but I knew I needed to have that record. I just knew it. I, I had never heard of Resist Resistance 77, knew nothing about them, but that intuitive voice said, bid on it, bid on it. So I did it the way we used to do in auctions. I took a sheet of paper and wrote down Resistance 77, Nowhere to Play, EP, bid, I think $3. And then I wrote down a bunch of other things on the list. Just be safe because, you know, if you're going to try to win records by auction and get it done by mail, if you get beat out, you want to win at least something and make it worth your while. So I sent my form in with an envelope and a stamp and then waited six to eight weeks and got a letter back saying, congratulations, you won such and such and so and so and blah, blah, blah in my auction. And one of them was the Resistance 77 record. All right, cool. So I, I, you know, I sent the guy the, the 10 or 11 bucks, shipping included, and six to eight weeks later, got my little package of records in the mail. 
And in it was the Resistance 77 record. Nowhere to play. Front's kind of nondescript. Back is kind of nondescript, you know, typical UK second wave punk rock. Ah, but look at that. Can you see the name of that song? Join the Army. And I was like, nah, couldn't be. Couldn't be the earworm that's been stuck in my brain for all these years. Is this the Join the Army? On a record that I bought completely on an intuitive whim? Took the record out the sleeve, put it on the turntable, dropped the needle on the groove, and what did I hear? Join the army! Join the army! It's no life at all! Join the army! Join the army! They'll put you up against the wall! Ha <laughs> ha! I was so happy! The intuitive voice once again steered me in the right direction. So for three bucks or whatever I got, the means to exterminate one earworm and add one really cool, obscure, veritably unknown UK punk rock band into my collection where it stays to this day. And it's right here, safely nestled in box number 10, the box that you, the people, decided that I should talk about. And that's what I just did here on this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. Boom! So as always, I want to thank everybody for tuning in, listening to me yammer for a few minutes. Mr. James Pogo of the Arm Delight Rifles. Hello, Chad, and of course, Robopuff and Janice and Larry and Doug. Thank you all for tuning in. Jake, hello, Jake. Always great to have you guys on board, my fellow music freaks and geeks. So yeah, don't forget, got to remind you again, Discogs and eBay, that's where you'll find me, Malcolm Tent. My record label and store name is TPOS. I think on eBay it's still called Trash American Style. So Trash American Style and or TPOS. You can't go wrong because it's me. And by shopping my stores, you keep me alive so I can talk to you some more. Send me your want lists. I got lots of goddamn records for sale. And I'll talk to them, I'll talk to you about them in person if you want you're serious, let me know. So that's it. I do hope to be back in about 167 hours. So until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>